so my name is Ben Murray. I'm a SAS CFO by trade and uh, came up through the finance and accounting ranks in, so in the airline industry, then got into software and now offer fractional SAS CFO services, do some coaching, teach courses in SAS metrics and finance and actually co-founded an app to uh, automate cash collections and uh, have a SAS news site. So really live and breathe SAS at this point in time. So today talking about SAS founder confessionals, uh, lessons learned from raising a cumulative $500 million. So I have a podcast as well where I interview SAS founders and one of those questions is tips and tricks, lessons learned in the fundraising process. And we know Nathan, big found, uh, fan of bootstrap companies, but we know SAS companies also raise capital. So what are those lessons learned? And of course, they always have something to say, or even if they could go back in time and redo their fundraising process, this is what they do. So let me hit click. So over the next 20 minutes, boy, yeah, that's small. Uh, talk about founder investor fit, know your milestones, and then storytelling. So we'll deep dive into these. And they, these were the th three recurring themes with raising capital. I'd say founder investor fit, probably number one on the leaderboard is finding that fit with investors. Uh, with your company. So first diving into founder investor fit. So vision fit, and we know, and I've talked to a lot of investor PE firms, we know they can talk SaaS, but they, do they know your vertical? Do they know prop tech, healthcare tech, gov tech? Can they define your competitors? That's a big thing. Have they done the research? Do they know your space? Or are they just speaking general SaaS terms here? And then what's their value add? What do you want them to bring to your company? What are the strengths that can help your company as an investor? And then finally, one thing, the big thing here is problem aligned with the investor vision. So is the problem you're trying to solve aligned with what they're trying to do? Say for example, in prop tech or healthcare tech or for your CRM system. So do you have alignment of what you want to achieve in that space? And the next thing is do your research. And the SaaS founder told me is that you are getting into bed with your lead investor. So do your reference checks, go out to lunch with them, have a drink with them, but do your reference checks to make sure they're a good fit. And this final thing, he said it's a dating process. So how do they show up? How do they treat you? How do they treat your management team? So that's really important. It's a dating process. And like the founder said, you're getting into bed with the lead investor. And then finally about relationships, all about relationships with fundraising. So get close to your investors. What do they want to achieve with that investment? You know, so not just about us as founders. We're, of course, want to achieve a lot of things, but what do your investors want to achieve with that investment? And then this came up a lot, this last bullet, be authentic. That came up a lot in conversations with SaaS founders when working with investors. Be authentic, and they want painful, sharp authenticity. So again, founder, invest, founder investor fit critical. These were the, I'd say, top of the leaderboard as far as going through that fundraising process. And then I've got a clip here, hopefully it'll play. Let's see, maybe not. From Mesh Payments, hopefully this play, let's see here. I don't think it's showing up, I don't know. All right, it looks like it disappeared. Maybe, I've got a couple more clips, I don't know if we can get those working, but. Uh, so I interviewed Oded, a co-founder CEO at Mesh, and oh, let's see, come on. we'll see if we can get it going here, but raise a 50 million Series B and talk about relationships. So important to have relationships with your investors. Maybe we can get that going, we'll see. So I love data points and through my SAS news site, collect a lot of data points on funding rounds. Uh, so if you're going after your seed, your Series A, you know, what are you looking at? Because I've helped founders and they're thinking about their seed and, and that's always the big question. Should I raise a million, a million and a half? What is that number? And so this is from the last six, month of, six months of fundraising announcements that I cover on my site. And you can see these are bottom quartile to top quartile and seed ranging around four million. You know, so it's important to get that, that, that initial amount that you're raised that you don't go too short. I think sometimes it's easy to not ask for enough. And one founder that I was helping raise a seed round, you know, looking in the million or two range where it's like, well, maybe he needs four, right? It takes a lot to go through product market fit and scale the company to that next phase. Uh, you saw Mesh with a Series B raise at 50 million, and that was in the top quartile for Series B. And then I find after that, Series C, D, and E, it, it varies all over the place, uh, but have some data points on that as well. And the next thing really important is defining your milestones. For the, so the first one, pick your targets. What are you trying to do with this capital? 
You know, are we, and there's so many different things that we could be doing. Sometimes we sold our vision, now we have the funding to build our product. Or maybe we're trying to find product market fit. Or maybe the next thing we've got product market fit and then we're scaling our go-to-market motion. So be specific as what we're trying to achieve with those milestones. And then one thing that came up a lot, I also asked SaaS founders, what were those triggers that led you to your raise? How did you know it was time to raise money? And that's always the big thing with SaaS founders, like, should I raise, should I not raise right now? And there are always triggers. And one thing, of course, that came up a lot, product market fit. You know, they saw product market fit and now it's time to take it to the next level. And the next value alignment, is your definition of value creation with your investor the same? Maybe they're going after enterprise value market share, but you want you know, user growth, or maybe you want to hit certain ARR targets. And of course, as a CFO, make sure you lock these targets in. Rolling targets are great, but lock in those targets. Otherwise, we don't know if we're achieving against those targets. Are we ahead, are we behind? So lock in those targets. And then finally, communicate. And again, this came up again, be authentic and transparent. And really, once you have the investor, right, you pick them because there's, there's strengths, there's value add there. So, you know, try to avoid those surprises. And even as, you know, CFOs, we know we try to avoid surprises with our board, with our executive team and our investors. Uh, and then also, this is a big thing, SaaS founders get busy. Frequent investors are frequent updates with your investors. And I'm talking to one founder, with those frequent updates, when they came to the next point where they needed more capital, they were opening their checkbook because they know exactly where that company stands. They know what's happening, what's the story. And also, if you're targeting potential investors, keeping them in the loop, you know, as far as what's going on with the company, because then when you're going for that next raise, they know the same thing. They know you, you're not pitching your company from scratch. And I've got another clip, but I don't know if it's gonna play here. I don't think so. Um, let's see. Yeah, nothing. All right. Oh, well. When we okay. raised our seed round, we considered that our calibration phase, the goal was to prepare scalable processes. We figured out product market fit. Now let's figure out a sales process, onboarding process, a service process that will allow us to bring this to multiple markets. And then now that we are in the scale up phase where we did our pre series A round, our goal is to go internationally yeah. and therefore a couple of new KPIs that kick in. So instead of measuring MR, we now talk in terms of AR. We also care about net dollar retention rate, ARPA, customer acquisition cost payback rate, sales funnel metrics. So, perfect, that played. So, uh, let's keep going here. Are you able, can you move it to the next? Oh, there we go. So, to summarize what Stefan said, here, you know, there are many different paths as you scale up your company, but we had the seed round, proof of concept, MVP, maybe selling your story, and next came product build, that product market fit stage. You know, so going through the build, discovery calls, finding that fit, and then finally, you know, then he called it calibration phase. You know, so now building out your systems, your processes, building out your staff, your people, and then next, the scale-up phase. So we have the calibration phase and then the scale-up phase. And now, adding staff, going after revenue, in, case, in Stefan's case, uh, going international as well. And then finally, getting him ready for the Series A. And the Series A then, you know, it's so important, we're selling our vision, but now at the Series A stage, we have to support our vision with metrics, with data. So he had that calibration phase, the scale-up phase, and then I put this kind of red danger warning symbol here because I've seen SaaS companies who are in this product build phase trying to find a product market fit and then trying to scale up their go-to-market engine because their, their cash is declining, the cash runway is depleting and they overlay go-to-market on top of product market build and then that creates a bunch of problems for your SaaS company. So there are phases, you get there in different ways, but be careful if you're overlaying go-to-market fit on top of your product market fit, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. 
And of course, more data here, median series C rounds, you know, anywhere from 30 to 95 million. And of course, a big change. You can see with the SAS crash, you know, big rounds, and now the median C down in the 30 to 50 million range. And there's a line missing from this chart, but also the volume of activity went down for median series C ranges, you know, or rounds. You know, so again, these can be 30 to 95 million, but a big change with the, the change in SAS valuations. And then finally, telling a compelling story. This came up over and over. So pitch deck snafus, uh, you know, answer questions that come up over and over. You know, your pitch deck has to tell a story. You know, so if those questions come up, answer those in the pitch deck so you have more time for discussion and analysis. And then formulate your vision. How will this investor money solve it? And then also, one SaaS founder said, set up a slide where you know the investors are going to ask a certain question so you can really nail that question. So really interesting tips and tricks with setting up your pitch deck. And then make it simple. One SaaS founder said, your superpower is taking the uh, complex and creating it into simple steps. And then finally, know your numbers, which of course I love as a CFO. So we know stage one, investor you know, fundraising is selling your vision. The next step, it does have to be supported by metrics. So that makes your story even more compelling when you can support your story with metrics and numbers. And then one more clip from a SaaS founder. Hopefully you can get this going. On pitch deck. Lessons learned that you'd like to share with other founders or just going through the fundraising process right now. So one of the, one of the biggest lessons we've learned is really watching to see where the investors are getting tripped up when you're going through your deck. But it may not be obvious. You may spend so much time creating what you think is the perfect deck, and you keep running into the same questions that the investors are asking you. So a great tip from Kathy Zhu. She's an attorney by trade, created a, work, a legal workflow automation product, raised a $3 million, I think, a seed round. Uh, so just getting that pitch deck right, a lot of reps, answering those questions so you have more, dis you have more time for discussion. And then another data point I collect at my SAS news, news site is just median employee sizes by these rounds. Of course, later stage, it could be almost anything, but if you're approaching that seed stage, median employees around 16, series A, 36, 82 for series B. So it just gives you some general sizing as far as where you stand against your peers when raising these capital rounds. So the last 20 minutes talked about founder investor fit. Again, that's number one on the leaderboard. Every SaaS founder I talked to, almost everyone talked about the importance of, of investor founder fit and then knowing your milestones, right? Picking those milestones and making sure that aligns with what your investors want to achieve. And then finally, storytelling. I've interviewed SaaS founders, CFOs at really large companies going after 250 million round raises and storytelling is part of that journey from C to series, E, F, X, whatever it might be. So again, three recurring themes with all these SaaS founders, you know, raising a bunch of capital to fund their business. And that's it, and if any questions, feel free to email me at Ben at the SaaS CFO. I don't know if we have time, Ray, for any questions, but uh, yeah, thanks for joining me today. It's nice to see the room filling up a little bit. Thank you for finding the finance and talent trap. <laughs> you know, we don't have another speaker for uh, until 11.40. So we have some time. And one of the best things about these type of events is talking to our peers who are experts in their particular category. So Ben, and I know that you like to be put in this box yeah. once a month on Monday Night Metrics. So let's make this a little bit of an AMA, ask me anything. Is there a SaaS finance topic you have an interest in, but maybe Ben can answer anything, whether it's reporting, metrics. I got to add here. Add a new line item. Does he scale the business to your P&L and L and chart accounts? Any questions? Right here. Okay. Hey everyone. So I'm with the Powerpop team, team of ten. Um, we've deployed about like 104 million dollars by now. We love dealing with Ben's clients. It's so critical when we're underwriting to get like clean financial data. Can we understand your balance sheet? Understand how to read your cash flow statement. Ben, my question to you is really, how do you see non-dilutive capital, especially with this whole SVB scenario, where a lot of deals we've been seeing, SVBs have been involved, they have really low rates, 
who knows what they're gonna, how they're gonna deploy capital in the future. How do you see the evolution of venture debt, non-dilutive capital evolve with equity as well in the coming months and, and years perhaps? Yeah, that's a great question. I see, you see now more, right, there's so many debt players coming into the space, right? Founder Path has been out there, we've been working together. Uh, and it just shows you with SB, SBB, you know, just the, doing a little bit more research on, you know, who you're working with. Of course, they're a large bank, you know, you never think they're going to fail. But I think there's so many players jumping into the space is just do your own due diligence, right? Uh, you know, they've got to sell you as well, not just you selling them. Uh, and debt can be the right thing. So for me with debt, is just making sure it fits within your cash flow structure, you know, that we can absorb it and what's the right use of it. You know, and I think, and in, in Nathan says, and I agree with this, is, you know, just don't look at this as a payment going out the door, right? What's the ROI on this? Are we investing, where are we investing this in sales and marketing to generate $2 for every dollar that they, they loaned you? You know, so I think it's, again, doing your due diligence. And for me as a CFO, of course, it's always making sure we can fit this into our cash flow structure. I'd also like to add to that. Um, there's a gentleman named Todd Gardner. He was the founder of SaaS Capital, one of the first revenue credit lending facilities for B2B SaaS companies. He's been doing a lot of research and some great posts on LinkedIn about alternative forms of financing. He also was on a podcast talking about what the SVP collapse means to you as a SaaS CFO and CEO. So also, I would recommend following Todd. He's a lot of good insights. With you, since you're the closest. Uh, hey, Ben. Uh, big fan of the articles in SaaS CFO. They're very insightful. So I'm Sri. I, uh, I run Alma Base. We bootstrapped our way to a few million in ARR. And uh, now, uh, I just wanted to understand, now say we want to raise a couple of millions of dollars for growth. As a founder, how do we uh, evaluate between the debt options I have, like from companies like Founder Path, and equity options uh, from uh, traditional investors? Choosing debt versus diluting some ownership for equity investment. Is there any framework or anything? I, yeah, I think it's a great question because when I've talked to SaaS founders when, when they're raising, sometimes it depends on the product. You need millions of dollars just to build out this product where you have no revenue coming in, right? That's where debt's just not gonna work unless Founder Path gives you some awesome like 10 year schedule. Uh, but you know, it, it, so there is, you know, we talk about the phases and early on, yeah, if you're looking for a seed round, usually you're gonna consume a lot of cash. And so in my opinion, debt might not work because you've got that repayment schedule. You know, so that's where you may need to take on equity because you're building it out, you're looking for product market fit. And then that next phase, you know, if you found product market fit, now we can scale a go-to-market engine. Then maybe, all right, we've got some revenue coming in. Now we can look at some debt, you know, so we don't dilute our existing shareholders. So it depends on the phase of your business. And of course, your cash flow structure. Uh, you know, so I found, you know, a lot where they could bootstrap, but it was very a light tech, technical product. Others where it just it took a lot of investment in dev to get them to a point to be sellable. Jenny. Well, for the recording, yeah. it helps. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Um, ben, could you um, share? Um, this is about treasury management in, in the current environment yep. specifically. Um, what approach should a SaaS startup take with idle cash? How, how to manage that? Yeah, that's a good question. When I've had treasury management function, right, falls on the CFO. And, you know, CFOs, I think we're operators. Uh, you know, we don't know where maybe to place that money. And that's where usually you need to partner with a good bank in their treasury function to help have that guidance to help you. Now, there are services out there almost like, I don't even know what you call them, platform as a service, where there's like treasury management as a service. I'm forgetting the name of one of those right now, where they can help you and take, take that out of cash. But the big thing is, right, how, my concern, how long is it gonna be locked up, right? Because we need our cash to fund our business. So if you do have excess cash, you know, especially with founders who maybe you just raised and you don't need to touch that cash, it is good to put it in, um, some sort of treasury management function to, to earn a little bit rather than just sitting there. Yeah, not to be a, not to be a one trick pony, but um, Todd Gardner actually was on the Metrics Major podcast two days ago, and it's a great 30 minute lesson, but one of the things he recommended was you have your standard savings checking bank manager, 
But then you go to like a Fidelity or a Schwab and open a treasury account, and it's very liquid, and you're getting pretty good short-term rates, and it's a different insurance profile. So look at a treasury kind of secure, one of the big guys. Yeah, find an expert. Hey, Ben, Charlie Fritsch. Hi, Charlie. How are you doing? Good. Um, so we started off bootstrapping, then I did a uh, convertible note raise, basically friends and family. We're now, we are thinking about an A round, and I wanna, wanted to ask if you would talk about that and uh, if a, a part-time CFO would be applicable now in that stage, and also how you work as a part-time CFO. Yep. And do you mind sharing the revenue range at all, where you're at right now? Revenue With your company? Yeah. yeah, we're approaching two million AR, and it will be between four and five million AR by the end of the year. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I would say for a fractional CFO, part-time CFO, usually it's a couple million in revenue at least because there's enough volume of data going through your company that we can really latch on to, you know, that we can calculate all your metrics, growth metrics, margins, retention, sales and marketing efficiency metrics. Less than that, it's the data's a bit sketchier, you know. So I think that, that for operationally as, as part-time CFO can help with that. And then part of that process is just putting in the metrics, the frameworks, so that you have, we talked about then, if you're going for a series A, you have the data, now the metrics to support that story. You know, so right, they're gonna ask you about retention, GDR, NDR, your efficiency and your go-to-market engine, you know, so you're ready. So I would say with founders, it's kind of twofold with a part-time CFO putting in the metrics, one, to run our business, and two, when you go and talk to stakeholders, investors, so that you're prepared for that. So they, they can help you for that. Usually I say above 10 million in revenue is when I think you should have your own CFO uh, are in that range, and it just depends. Uh, but less than 10 million can definitely take advantage. And uh, you talk about how you work as a part-time? How, how do you work as a part-time CFO? Uh, or should we talk about that person? We can talk, I actually have a couple clients in the room, we can talk to them, but uh, yeah, we can talk about that or email me, but yeah, Scott. And, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, we, we can always talk about that. Ben, I'm going to piggyback on that. Yeah. Um, we were talking about what to look for when you look for an investor. Same with their fractional CFO. Find out if she or he has worked with venture capital firms previously. Do they have that relationship? Because that's really important. When you're first time you're looking at equity financing, it's that personal referral. That managing director, general partner to VC firm is much more likely to invest time and even take you more seriously if it's a personal introduction. And a fractional CFO is a great point of contact for you. Other questions? Hi, Ben. Hi. Uh, we're B2B SaaS doing around five to 10 million AR right now. Uh, so I kind of want to want your take on how should the finance team structure look like at the five to 10 mil AR? And how should the finance team structure when we grow to like 10 mil plus? And what are some of the process and control? Because when we started, we started Bootstrap. Everyone had the company credit card. Uh, like they just spend whatever they need. And I basically told everyone, just treat it like your own money is good. Yeah. Uh, but now I feel like we're at a size where things need some control. Yeah, I'd say five to 10 million, things are getting more complex. Usually what I see less than 10 million AR your accounting is outsourced. Rarely do I see someone, an in-house accountant or controller, which is nice, it's a nice plus when they do have that. But usually, accounting is outsourced to a firm that understands SaaS, so you can get your bookkeep in place, produce financial statements on a timely basis, and then maybe see what your needs are. How complex are your invoicing? Do we need to bring that in-house and we invoice on behalf of ourselves versus the accounting firm doing that? Uh, so usually, less than 10, it's around the accounting function. You know, do we want to bring some of that staff in? Do we want to have, say, a staff accountant who oversees the outsourced accounting firm? And then we build from there. You know, then it's like, all right, do we want, you know, to bring a controller in? Then do we want to bring in, you know, maybe then a CFO at some point, then an fp and hire? But usually it's around accounting. It's outsourced. Makes, and you can get a lot of runway from outsourced accounting and then decide what to bring in. Yeah, you know, the other thing I would add is we have someone else in the audience, David Apple, who heads up the subscription revenue business at Sage. 
He talks to hundreds of SaaS companies your size every year that's thinking about what's that financial tech stack infrastructure I need. So he's in the back. I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about what he's seeing as far as best practices regarding financial automation. One of the, and I was talking to Anna about this earlier, for the first time, financial automation has seen its real day in the sun. Things like automating spend management or automating the entire closing process. So now is an opportunity for you to get financial operational efficiency in place. Kind of that 10 million and above you should really think about that. Any other questions? Okay, right. Ben, anything you wanna, any, you, you talk to SaaS finance people every day, any last minute advice, even beyond um, funding you would give to really bulletproof your financial operations infrastructure? Well, now, I mean, tech is such a big thing, it's, but it, it's, Things that I see over and over as you scale your SaaS company, one, it's always, you know, I always say it's not sexy, but it's satisfying is your accounting foundation, right? We've got to have the accounting foundation in place. And then from there, we create our SaaS P&L. And there's so much data you can take from your SaaS P&L. And then from there, put it in the SaaS metrics. So it's a journey, but it starts with accounting. And then thinking about our tech, our roadmap, our core accounting software, then do we need invoicing software, revenue management software, sales tax compliance, those are the first few things that I'm really focused on. And then from there, travel and expense, different things, spend management, uh, but there's an evolution. So CFOs need their own product roadmap for their finance and accounting organization. Great, Ben, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.